Hey, and welcome today to our coaching session on career paths in the agricultural extension services. Uh, this presentation is part of Green Leaders DC Natural Capital Campaign in the spring of 2016. So today to talk to us about some of the skills and some of the challenges and opportunities that are available in that sector uh, is Bill Hubbard and he comes to us from Georgia. Bill, thanks for being with us. Uh, great introduction. Uh, many of us have um, fallen into the extension service uh, as a career path and uh, what I'd like to see is more young professionals uh, choose that as a career path, something that uh, the earlier they can find out about these opportunities, the more they can um, find the right kind of education, mentoring tools, so that if this is a career for them, uh, it, uh, they're, they're much better prepared to uh, hit the ground running. And so I got started in extension uh, back um, several, several years ago, <clears throat> filling in for a state extension forester at the University of Florida who was on sabbatical. And I jumped right into it, um, um, working with um, forest, forest landowners in particular, working on timber taxation um, presentations and these kinds of things. So for a guy that wasn't very comfortable getting up in front of a crowd to all of a sudden have to know both the content and how to engage with an audience was, was quite a challenge. And I wish I would have had a little more training and mentoring uh, in that arena. So the extension service is a vast, um, and to some very confusing organization um, with lots of moving parts. And so, um, okay, so as Lauren mentioned, um, Bill Hubbard and I work in the Southern region. It's a very unique position in that I work across 13 states in the Southern United States. And the area that I work in is in forestry and natural resources. And I also am a liaison to a federal agency, uh, the USDA Forest Service. And so, Again, we're going to talk about some of the exciting opportunities um, in extension and um, what that might mean to you. So just a little brief background in history, which I think is, is very interesting from the perspective of someone interested in the extension service, is that it started out um, by the people for the people back in the late eight, mid, to, mid to late 1800s, right around the Civil War, um, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Morell. Uh, created uh, some legislation and it was voted into into law and it was right around the Abraham Lincoln era and so Mr. Lincoln, President Lincoln uh, was charged with um, um, enacting this uh, with uh, obviously several legislators uh, but each state was granted a tract of federal land to actually create or, or use that land to to create a public institution of higher learning uh, of course, many of you know that 130, 40 years ago, most of the United States, most of this country was in agriculture and farming. And the idea was that uh, through applied research, through a network of universities, experts that could uh, create this uh, new research and new knowledge, um, we, could, we could do a lot more to improve the family, for, the family farm uh, family and consumer sciences, things like canning and home health and um, insect and disease kinds of pest issues uh, that were uh, pretty prevalent back then in the late 1800s. And so um, the, other, the other thing to think about also is that um, this was meant to be, um, regardless of whether um, you're dealing with African Americans or um, traditional European Americans, the idea was that uh, all, all were created equal. Um, and so the 1890s institutions are the historically black colleges and universities also received funding. Um, these in the southern region, mostly in the southern region are Tuskegee University, Fort Valley, Alcorn, North Carolina, a and And these continue to today, as a matter of fact. And so the land grant was very important. Um, follow, this followed uh, uh, several years later by the extension grant that, that actually brought extension um, into the mix, getting that research out into the real world. And so that's the exciting thing. Um, we know today that there are lots of different people that provide information, education, technical assistance. And if you boiled the extension service down, that would be what we do. We are um, an unbiased source. We are a science-based source of information that comes out from these universities that originally were were created for farming but now are 
of, of course, many world-class top tier research institutions and anything from um, bio, you know, medical professions to finance and industry and, and environmental sciences and these kinds of things. But many of these universities are still very well known agricultural research organizations um, dealing with these big problems that Lauren mentioned about food systems and where do we get safe, uh, healthy food and, and how do we um, communicate healthy living, living styles to an increasingly obese society. And so there are some really, really exciting things that are being done through the extension service. And sometimes I like to think of it as, as a Peace Corps for the United States. I know we do have AmeriCorps and a lot of AmeriCorps does deal with teaching and, and these kinds of things, but the extension service is something that you can basically uh, contribute to a societal change to improve society, uh, one person at a time, through groups, through new technologies, you name it. So it's an exciting field because you're attached to those universities. Uh, you're, you're in there for the lifelong learning of it all. But um, again, we work in a, in a world where there's lots of different information. Some of it's correct and some of it's uh, you know a little bit questionable, especially when you're on the internet. Uh, but we work with universities, county agencies, uh, state and federal agencies, and then there's a number of private sources also that, that may uh, provide this kind of information for a fee. Um, Extension typically does not charge fees for their services. They're a taxpayer-based public service. However, due to budgets, um, more and more of our services, uh, we're charging at least a recovery fee, small fees for workshops or publications or videos, mobile applications, these kinds of things. So, so that's the world we operate in. And again, why is this? Why do we uh, invest in the extension service? And again, there's just a number of economic, social, and environmental uh, benefits due to that. Uh, in a truly perfect world, maybe these things could be picked up in the private sector, but we all know uh, concepts like the tragedy of the commons and um, and the fact that the markets don't always create this equal uh, opportunity for people to receive the kinds of information that they need to to uh, you know have healthy uh, forests and, and drinking water and food and these kinds of things and so a number of economic social and environmental reasons why this this unique service exists here in the United States and really nowhere else in the world at least at the level that we have and speaking of that level, um, this is another area that oftentimes gets uh, people a little bit confused. Many, many people know about the teaching and research aspects of the land grant university system, but very few, and I've been in this field for close to 30 years, understand what the extension service is and why do you have the extension service? Oftentimes we may say, well, you know about 4-H, don't you? And uh, that may or may not uh, get people thinking about what extension is. But for the most part, extension is that lesser known of the three arms, the three legs of that land grant university system. Again, if you look at other universities, uh, they may have outreach services, uh, but they are not set up the way that the land grants are. And part of the very unique and very productive reason that extension has existed for over 100 years is the size of the system. Our system is in every county in the United States. Uh, it's a state-based uh, system through the land-grant universities, and I can give you some examples. The University of Georgia, for example, is a state-based land-grant university. Uh, the state of Georgia has 159 counties, of which there's an extension presence of one sort or another in each of those counties. Uh, they have both agricultural and natural resources um, expertise that cover those counties, family and consumer sciences, or uh, youth, 4-H, these kinds of things. Lots of exciting things going on there. And the other thing is they're attached to over 16,000 faculty and staff. And so there's a huge network of problem solvers, of researchers, of communicators that over the years have basically um, solved many of the biggest issues that we have in the in the country. Um, let me get rid of this. Excuse me. 
Um, and so when we talk about these issues like climate change, we talk about bioenergy, they're not solved in the same manner that uh, things were solved 100 years ago where you could just uh, basically put a plot out on a 40 acre tract of, of land and see which hybrid corn grew faster than the other. Um, these involve huge networks of, of biologists and economists and sociologists and and where else would you get that other than a, a very large land grant university that can handle that and so again very very exciting opportunity to work with um, the biggest big problems and big opportunities of the day so that's the other thing is we, we do like to turn problems into opportunities within the extension service and we think globally and we definitely act locally um, the other thing that people get confused about when we talk about extension, and I think anyone considering a career in extension needs to understand that you can you can get a job at any one level, any of these levels that I've got here on the screen. Uh, we are consi we consist of federal experts and specialists, state level experts and specialists, and then county level experts and specialists and and agents, and each one of these performs a very unique and a very important role. Our federal groups are, are looking out um, for national issues. There's program leadership in dozens of different areas in agriculture and in, in forestry and natural resources, family and consumer sciences. These areas, um, they oftentimes uh, bubble up uh, issues that are coming um, across the globe like climate change they'll they'll provide some funding they'll bring in uh, external partners other federal agencies the federal agency that we deal with is a group called the national institute of food and agriculture and this has been a recent change an attempt to make um, others aware of the importance of extension so we fit within NEFA, which is an interesting little acronym, and work well with very at the federal level with lots of other federal partners nonprofit groups, you name it. So that's kind of that political national leadership end of things. At the state level, you have land grant uh, university uh, facilities and support. Uh, those are where the research goes uh, goes on. Oops. Uh, the re a lot of the research in the laboratories out in the fields and the farms and the forests, all that goes on with with state level leadership, oftentimes in concert with others around the country. Um, there's, you know, actual bricks and mortar out there where, where people are investing, taxpayer supported, lots of staff, um, the, the extension end of things. <clears throat> there's lots of um, new technologies being incorporated at the land grant university level, um, the creation of, of educational materials, and those can be fact sheets, those can be videos, those can be websites mobile applications, um, materials for, for volunteers to use. Um, there's lots of funding available uh, at the state level uh, to, to incorporate and increase extensions capacity to, to deal with these problems. And then again, at more external partners, lots of partnerships within extension. Every day in extension is, is a very unique, exciting day. I can tell you that from close to 30 years experience is that no two days are ever alike and I don't know too many other professions where you could say that because you could be dealing with um, working with minority landowners one day, climate change the next, urban forestry issues the next day. And again, these are just uh, from my perspective in forestry. The, the agricultural arena is, again, bursting with those kinds of opportunities to work with external partners to make a difference on the ground uh, nationally, internationally. And perhaps the most important um, partnership we have out there where the rubber hits the road is at the county level. Office facilities are there in most uh, all of the 3,000 counties. Um, again, budgets have shuttered a few here and there, but for the most part, there's a presence in every county. And I challenge you sometime to locate where your county extension office is and just stop in there and see what they do and, and see what uh, you might get involved in at that local level. Uh, so there's lots of support there at the local level. They've got travel and funding to, to answer questions. And again, they're out there oftentimes one-on-one -on -one with farmers. Uh, as Lauren said, that that old era of um, that one-on-one -on -one 
personal advisement will never go away. That is a very important component where the county agents get to know the, the, their stakeholders, they get to know the stakeholders' issues, and then work with the state and federal sources to, to solve those issues. And again, most of the issues that county agents deal with are not unique to their county. They're, there's just a huge importance to, to bring together uh, interests from other counties, states, and sometimes even nations. So lots of partnerships. And I mentioned this already, but again, it's the way we extend the university to the people, provide that unbiased research-based knowledge. The real world is our campus. Uh, you've, in this career, you've got to love to travel. You've got to love to get out there and rub shoulders. Um, lots of meetings, uh, lots of opportunities to overextend yourself, um, and lots of opportunities to uh, overextend yourself too much. Uh, just a word of word of advice there. But um, anybody that likes to see a difference on the ground and knows the importance of education and and how you know you teach a a, a person to fish rather than give them that fish. If you abide by that and you want a quick, fast way to make a difference, to feel rewarded, then extension, extension is the job for you. And I'm not trying to sell it, sell it at all, but I'm just saying that that's the experiences that I've had from day one when I started this job. Again, just lots of links and lots of opportunities. So again, we talked to historically, uh, as this country was highly agricultural, you had agricultural systems and home economics and those were the big ones and you had you had the youth in there as well but primarily we were interested in helping that farmer get the most out of their most productivity out of their property to understand what the crops were and how to ensure productive healthy crops and ensure that the bull weevil wasn't going to wipe them out and so you can see there's some real opportunities and needs in the traditional pr uh, programs historically and those continue to today as we have more and more issues and problems with our food sources and more and more opportunities and more and more questions about um, concepts like uh, genetically modified organisms and and things like that that um, that are tough tough problems to solve so again at the heart of extension is practical knowledge bringing that out uh, through field trials as you see the examples here with the potatoes um, oftentimes a very effective way in the past with extension was to go through the youth and 4-H programs and have the kids come home and grow a crop and ask for a piece of property that their that their mom or dad owned and grow some corn or grow some potatoes with a new method with a new seed source and lo and behold the farmer sees what his son or daughter has brought home through 4-H and within the next year is implementing that. So the, the one, just one technology that one technique that has been very successful over the years. This is just a little interesting diagram that shows that connection between the researcher, the extension service professional and the end user and just the importance that, that we have in working with not just other researchers or extension specialists, but you get to work with stakeholders. You get to work with industry organizations and representatives and, and um, environmental NGOs and governmental agencies. And they're constantly barraging you with, with issues that they need to work on. And, and oftentimes, have you, as your career moves on, you find solutions um, very easily. Other times you put it into the, the research hopper mix, try to find some funding for it, and then work closely with the research community to analyze that data and, and do all that kind of thing. So those are the cool things, uh, again, that you can think about from that big picture. Those of you just starting an extension might not see maybe the importance of this, but uh, as the years go on, I know that this is where your real reward comes from, is working with that research community and the stakeholder community. So again, this is a little bit of a summary of, of what I've talked about. We solve problems, we're client-driven, we're research-based. We ascribe to the lifelong learning um, mantra where you're never too old to learn something new. And again, we're big on partnerships. And Lauren, let me know if, we're, um, if you want to stop at any time and take some questions.
Uh, no, at this point, uh, go ahead and do your presentation, and uh, we'll have a discussion following that. Okay, great, great. Well, there won't be a test on this part, <laughs> but uh, this is another fascinating aspect that has actually been researched over the years by sociologists, and one of the uh, um, greatest rural sociologists of all times uh, brought this concept to the table, which is used in marketing and business and medicine and so many other fields today. But this professor in Iowa just was very fascinated by how new information gets through a system. How, if, I, if I'm a researcher at a university and I have just discovered a product or uh, a seed source, a hybrid seed corn um, uh, kernel, seed, sorry, that, that could double yields, um, how does that go farm by farm and how long does it take to get out into the community and of farmers and so he studied this for a career and actually wrote a textbook and has got four versions of it out now uh, passed away just maybe five or six years ago but has spent 50 years studying this and again like I said um, the whole marketing profession has grown on some of this early rural sociology work and if we just look at the bottom you'll you'll see and you could put yourself in one of these categories maybe with with what you do on your daily ba uh, daily living. There's the innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards. And so with any technology, uh, you may be something different. I'm a, I'm a pretty, pretty big innovator, if you ask my staff, on new technologies, on, um, uh, you know, the latest and greatest um, tools out there from, got to have the newest iPhone because I know I can, do more with it or uh, got to have a new headset because it sounds clearer and better. So, so I'm all about new, new stuff in that perspective. And my mind is always thinking of what's the next um, technology I could use or, or we could use in our profession. I'm not, I've found out uh, uh, through discussions with my children, I'm not really an innovator as far as music goes or fashion. So I'm a laggard when it comes to that. I'm still listening to, uh, 1970s and 80s um, rock and roll where you know uh, there's a lot of I guess you could call them innovators listening to some of that newer stuff but every technology every every area of the market is going to be different so you're you can consider yourself an innovator in some respects and a laggard in other but with any given technology you're going to have this kind of, of um, field of players and innovators are out there they're risk takers they're going to try something new uh, they might get burned because uh, you know a new iPhone might cost 600 bucks um, versus an older version that's 300 and, and in, in reality you're not really getting that much more out of that extra 300 it doesn't matter though they're going to try anything the early adopters wait to see what happens first with those innovators and and they talk to the innovators and they say hey do you think it was worth it so they're sitting back there a little bit, waiting to see what happens. Uh, they might trial test something, um, but they're not going to jump in feet first until they kind of let things trend a little bit. Early majority, again, similar. These are on a continuum, so you can't necessarily um, discreetly put anybody in one category or another. Late majority laggards, uh, those, uh, you know, again, don't need to, too much explanation. But there's textbooks on this, again. Um, this concept is a way to get uh, marketers to, to sell you products. And so this is, again, something huge that's taken over our whole world of, of online marketing, of TV ads and commercials, and you name it. And so that blue line shows pretty much that market share. And then the yellow line shows the percentage of adoption of a, of a technology. So if it's a decent technology and it goes through fruition or whatever, ultimately you're going to end up uh, saturating that market um, and moving on to the newer next technology and so you know something like the iPod uh, you can see a lot of early growth there and then it kind of peaked out and you know who buys iPods anymore now it's all about iPhones so within diffusion of innovations a few other concepts you've got innovation communication time and the social system and all these are researchable cool concepts that I hope newer professionals out there think about this up front when they get into this profession rather than, okay, I just want to go out and, and, you know, teach somebody how to fish. Um, well, there's a lot of, a lot of cool things you can do with, with that and how to teach not just that person, but maybe a whole, whole society how to fish. 
So we have exploded as far as new, uh, new programming areas. As I mentioned before, we had agricultural and family uh, systems. Now we've included both those, but environmental and natural resources, lots of international work going on these days, pest management, technology and engineering, biotech and genomics. So anything that you can dream of being involved in is out there. And, and it's traditionally been agriculture and closely allied fields. But many universities now, and I can name a few like Oregon State University, the Ohio State University, are looking at the success of extension and the agricultural extension service and using it in other areas like business and medicine and health and these kinds of things. And so this, it's only taken 100 years to, for some of these or, uh, universities and agencies to realize this, but the strength of the extension service, how we drive research, how we use research, how we evaluate the impacts of research is, again, just an amazing tool that uh, you don't see anywhere else in the world. So it's an exciting era to be part of Extension Service. You don't have to be just an agricultural uh, or agriculturally oriented professional. You can be business and finance or, like I say, health or what have you. So when we talk about Extension and a career in Extension, you have the distinction between a big P program and a little p program. Um, programs are more than fact sheets, workshops, and websites. And a little p program might be putting on a workshop on how to, you know, fish the Nantahala River, um, you know, with the latest and greatest technologies. Um, a big P program might be how to how are those how is that fishery system sustainable? And so you can usually sell the big P programs based on societal needs. Um, the little P programs come after the big P programs, but this is an important concept for anybody getting involved or interested in extension in, in that you are dealing with larger issues and a program where you might focus your efforts. You'll be able to um, go back and judge the impacts of your work. And some of these, at least from my perspective, again, I'm, I'm being a little biased here uh, because of my background, uh, but examples of some programs that we're working on are climate change. Forest health is a huge programming area these days, and some of that does relate due to climate change and the effects of catastrophic weather and these kinds of things. Uh, bioenergy, um, again, a big, big issue in the 70s uh, and came back about 10 years ago when gas prices started to reach 4 or $5 a gallon. And now that's abated a little bit, so bioenergy is is um, kind of changing um, uh, importance these days, but not going away by any means. Um, and then just some more specific ones like econ and investments for private landowners and an alternative forest products. I'm going to slide by these because um, I'd really like to have some interaction if we could. But um, again, forestry extension is part of agriculture. It's it's similar to agricultural extension. We work quite a bit with private forest landowners uh, who own close to 200 million acres of forest land across the country. A lot of people don't realize that, but um, it's a multi-billion dollar industry and that's just the market values, but you have um, non-market values and you see a few of those biodiversity um, on the lower right hand side there with the, with the butterfly and all that. Um, ecosystems like you see above that, uh, you've got wildlife and recreation, hunting, these kinds of things. And so forest landowners need that information. They desire that information. Many of them are not from traditional agricultural backgrounds. They may live, live 100 or 500 miles away, and they need advice. And why do we give them advice? Not just to help them individually, but there's a landscape scale impact. There's a societal impact. And so if we can help individual landowners achieve their goals and objectives, that also achieves goal, the goals and objectives of society. So it's pretty cool. It's a win-win situation. Um, again, 4-H and youth, our, our future is right there in front of you. If you can see that, uh, one of my most enjoyable weeks of the year is the one week I spend up in West Virginia working with the high school kids uh, who aren't necessarily kids anymore, but their minds are still very spongy and to get them out in the woods and do some compass and pacing, tree identification, um, light bulbs go off in their heads and many of them choose a field in either natural resources or extension. Um, but I want to definitely put a plug in there. 
uh, as natural re as extension uh, specialists, we work very closely with professional foresters and natural resource professions. They oftentimes are boots on the ground, and so we translate information to them, and then they in turn translate information out to the real world. Urban, the field of urban forestry is expanding like you wouldn't believe. People realize the importance and value of trees in the city, and they're putting uh, resources towards that end. And the need for extension work in urban communities has never been greater. We've almost flip-flopped or, or more the number of people that live in cities now compared to farms. And if we're going to spend the same amount of resources dealing with farms as we are with cities as we did 100 years ago, we're not solving society's problems like we need to be. And so there's an increasingly in increasing interest in urban extension work. And one of the ways we do it in the forestry profession is through urban forestry. And again, uh, allied professionals like landscape architects, designers, public officials, all those down the road um, that we work with. So I thought I'd just end with some cool stuff we're working on here in the South because it's not all about um, plows and cows, but lots of technology. Um, we balance it with, um, with that face-to-face -face work, but we realize that the world is, turns to the internet oftentimes for information and education. And this is our source, and this is one that we have to prove our value because I remember somebody asking me about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, he's, he's a good, good, good professor of mine, uh, respected him quite a bit, and he said, now that we have the internet, do you think we really need extension anymore? And that, that burned a little bit, that hurt, and I had to think about that for a while, and I thought, we need extension now more than ever because of that, because of the vast amount of information out there on the internet that isn't necessarily good information. And so extension most going to be one of your most trusted sources of information out there. So I'll get off my soapbox on that one. Um, another area is uh, through what we're doing today, for example, uh, webinars and, and Google Hangout presentations. Uh, today's professional, uh, they require continuing education. They desire it. They need it. And so we have, um, we, we now, be, between the agriculture and forestry world, just on our webinar portal alone, uh, conduct several uh, hundred, have conducted several hundred webinars to keep our profession up to speed. And there's just an example of some of them that we've done in the past. Basically, A to Z um, in agriculture and forestry webinar work. Um, videos, again, we've got lots of uh, high-quality streamed videos online at, at a website called forestryvideos.net. We work very closely with the community to develop mobile applications, um, and the, we've got a site on our website, uh, or a link on our website that shows the mobile applications. And we work closely with other organizations within the forestry arena, and I've spent uh, more than enough time talking about the importance of partnerships. So. So I'm going to wrap it up here and hopefully have time for some questions. Um, if you're considering a career in extension, these are the kinds of things that, that resonate with me that hopefully will with you too. The, the fact that um, you know, these are learner-driven uh, issues we're working with, you'll, you'll feel, you, you will feel rewarded because people use your information, they appreciate it, and the way you deliver it's very important obviously, but your adoption, your dissemination of that new information so that others pick it up will be increased greatly. It's not like uh, when you're in fifth or sixth grade and you're and you have to learn that or you flunk out of school. You don't, you know, learners, adults for the most part are are asking for this information and it's much easier to work with a group like this. So existing technologies um, through the state and region, lots of things going on there. It's a very time-tested approach and uh, based in theory of information and education. Again, I said that kind of a thing, lots of scholarship of in investments there. Technologies, innovations are tested and improved until they fit the user's needs. And so again, we're a, we're a big laboratory and um, we, we're kind of learning on the fly. We call it adaptive management. So we'll, we'll learn new technologies and get it out in the field very quickly. Um, it's really important, I think, is to solve problems. We're not going to spend lots of um, um, time uh, in the lab 
And to do that, uh, you know, sometimes that stuff doesn't get out in time. So extension is really good about that. We, we don't waste time waiting for something to be peer reviewed before we get it out. We, we are working with researchers now to get the information out before those peer reviewed publications. Um, lots of um, feedbacks between the research and the field and lots of flexibility. It's not a, necessarily an eight to five job. There's lots of travel, lots of nights and weekends work. Uh, but the the relationships that you build and develop uh, are unbelievable. And again, it's a lifelong lifelong career for many many people that I know, and many of them hate to leave it when it's time to retire. So, so you know, as someone looking at this, you you don't know some of some people don't know if they're set up to be an extension. But I will say that you'll you'll have to um, give it some consideration based on whether you're comfortable in front of crowds, whether you uh, are, are interested in that research outreach continuum, um, whether you like being um, associated with the university system, lots of different questions to ask yourself, lots of different skill sets to, um, to think about if, if one is interested in a career in extension.